Plus 25, copy. You're running from Los Robles, Colorado. Cover the group. Plus 25, yeah. Freeze, motherfucker! Ah! Look out! Oh no! Hey! Is he the only one? Yeah. Make my day, you fucker. Look! That guy in the car is like shot. I don't know. What do you think? Shit. Steven Goldberg, 42, truck driver, shot in the left shoulder. Rosemary Fenner, 37, Secretary, shot on the left knee. Catherine Bokar, 29, part-time teacher, forehead grazed. Three innocent civilians were wounded by a good conscientious police officer. The explanation is simple. He had the wrong weapon with him. A shotgun is the wrong weapon in just about any situation where you can expect innocent people to be nearby. In a busy area like this, there are too many elements you can't control and may not even notice. New York City, where around every corner lurks a hustler. A cocksucker, a pimp, a thief, a killer, all of them with a hard luck story waiting to be told. And this is one of them, Police Stories. Tonight's episode, The Butcher of Tompkins Square. New York City has always been the land of the haves and the have-nots. On one corner, you got the New York Stock Exchange turning over billions a year of blood money. And on another corner, you got a mother cradling a child that's starving to death. But wherever you find contradictions in life, you'll find someone that wants to pull up the slack. And speaking of slack, meet one slacker named Danny Rockowitz. Danny relocated from Texas to New York in the mid-1980s. By all accounts, he was harmless, just another poor bastard who'd fallen through the cracks of the sidewalk of life. He spent a lot of his teens homeless, and I guess because of that, he wanted to help others who were suffering from the same ordeal. And God knows, in the 1980s, there was enough of them, where all you had to do was throw a rock and you'd hit a beggar or a tramp. But do me a favor, if you're gonna throw it, Throw it hard. And while we're on the subject of tramps, meet one Monica Bureau. A 26-year-old that came over from Switzerland with ambition. Speaking the Deutsch. And I guess you could say she was a real Swiss miss. And although I doubt she tasted like chocolate, I'm willing to bet that she was just as sweet. Going to school training to be a dancer, she worked the titty bars at night, and she came to the Big Apple to make apple crumble. But one thing about apples, sometimes they got a worm in them. And if you're gonna be in the gutter, you gotta get down on your knees. How do you like them apples? For associates are to be believed. This is something that Monica had no problem with. Danny was known throughout the East Village for his big cock. A big cock that he would often let the children play with and hold and even kiss. He called his cock Rooster and wherever Danny went, he took his cock with him. He was also a bit of a religious fanatic and a soothsayer, a shaman of sorts, and attempted to start his own religion several times, telling whoever would listen, I am the Lord of Lords. But no one wanted to buy what Danny had to sell and he was a cult of one. With many putting his fanatical views and eccentricities down to the amount of dope that he smoked. But it wasn't all peace and love with Danny. He had a temper. Once his cock got up on the table and spilled his drink, he then grabbed his cock and beat it in front of everyone, terrifying the children. 
Danny didn't have a job in the traditional sense. I suppose now he'd be seen as a fundraiser. He'd go to local businesses in the area, supermarkets, restaurants, and he'd ask for donations. Whether cash or food, pots, pans, and then he'd set up a shelter in donated spaces at their like buildings. And if there was any left over, he'd take it for himself. He was dedicated, working 16, 17 hours a day. And although homeless when he arrived in New York, living in the streets, he met a couple so impressed by his charity work that they rented him a spare room in their apartment. And for the first time in Danny's life, he had security. But two years later, the couple broke up but needed to move out of the apartment, threatening that security. With no way to now pay the rent himself, he was very anxious. And the owner of the apartment was dubious of making Danny the main key holder because although he paid rent, he didn't have what many would consider a traditional job. And this is when Danny met, as if almost by fate, Monica Burel. She'd heard through the grapevine that he might have a place to rent. And because apartments at that time were so difficult to find in the East Village, it was a sought after space. But many people in the area knew of Monica. And she had a reputation for being someone who used people, men in particular. And she was cold and heartless, sleeping with men and women to get what she wanted. And they warned Danny to stay clear of her, because they feared that once she became the key holder, she'd kick Danny out and leave him homeless again. But once she started sleeping with Danny, he couldn't even think straight. He was captivated by her pussy pie. I guess he was in love. But after Monica moved in, her attitude changed almost immediately. One night, he told her of his dream to take a derelict old hospital in the city and turn it into a home for leg mentals where the goofy bastards could all move in and there'd be no stairs and elevators and they could just all play ping pong all day and other non-leg dependent activities. But she laughed in his face and told him that he was an idiot. And she also laughed at his cock. You can laugh at a man's dream, but don't laugh at his cock. And it was shortly after this that everyone's predictions came true and Monica told Danny that she wanted him out of the apartment. And to make matters worse, she started to bring men home and openly sleeping with them. It was one night that she brought two Rastafarian men home and they spit roasted her in the kitchen while Danny was in the bedroom they shared, sobbing. Danny'd had enough. It was on a Saturday afternoon at the homeless center that Danny started and with public donations kept open each day, feeding breakfast, lunch, and dinner to the homeless that one of those homeless individuals bid into what they thought might be a finger. But for whatever reason, the goofy bastard continued to eat his stew. Shortly afterwards, one of the women serving found what looked like to be a big toe in the tuna casserole. Alarmed by this, she decided to investigate and went to Danny's apartment. When she arrived, the door was partially open and there was a pot boiling on the stove. So the old broad lifted the lid, looked inside the pot, and there was the face of Danny's girlfriend, although I'm guessing now ex-girlfriend, looking back at her. And by all accounts, Monica had the same bitchy look on her face in death that she did in life. Her head boiling amongst the potatoes and carrots, and some oregano with a little salt, probably a pinch of pepper. When the shaken volunteer approached Danny back at the kitchen and asked him what he'd done, he told her that he'd cut off Monica's head and made a delicious soup out of her brain. And when it tasted yummy, he started cutting off other parts of her and making stew out of her. And that was so good, he figured he'd share it with his homeless amigos. And then he offered the old broad a bowl of the brain soup, to which she refused and excused herself and went and called the cops. And although Danny's crime was heinous, few at the shelter could blame him because Monica was a stone cold bitch. And if anyone deserved to be served up, then shit out 12 hours later into a toilet bowl, it was that cold hearted bitch. After all, Danny had done so much for the community. What did Swiss Miss do except forget her breast assists out every night? He even let all the children play with his cock. And who did she ever serve? except herself. But I guess at the end of the day, it's just another tragic New York story. Part two of tonight's presentation, a headless body at a topless bar. Most of us at some point in our check it history have been at a bar and complained about the tab, not remembering what we ordered because we were too wasted. 
And most of us, when this happens, keep some form of dignity, and we sneak out the back door and run. But not all of us are so, what's the word, eloquent. Take, for example, one Charlie Dingle. The 22-year-old had been at the titty bar all day and night, sniffing coke and emptying the bar of their cheapest stock. But when it came time to settle the tab, Charlie figured he didn't order the light beer, because light beer is for fags. His words, not mine. But when the bartender insisted he paid, he put a bullet in his head. Jeez. Sister Christian, overtime has come. And you know ah, fuck off. You don't even know the guy. Now attempting to turn lemons into lemonade, Dingle told everyone to hand over their cash. While he was going through a woman's purse, he found a business card that said she was a mortician. So he got the bright idea for her to dig out the bullet of his victim's head so he could take the evidence with him. Good idea, right? Wrong. Because after 20 minutes of her digging out this guy's head with a steak knife, all she was doing was making everyone hungry. And Dingle was losing his patience, so he got the bitch to use a steak knife and cut off the bartender's head. And she did, cutting through his neck like a quarterhouse steak. And Dingle got her to drop it into an empty wine box. But I guess this made him horny, cause he went and grabbed a titty bar dancer and fucked her in front of 22 hostages while he held a gun to her head. Then he went outside with two of the titty bar dancers and the bartender's head and he hailed a cab, ordered the driver out and sped away into the night. But after he pulled into a parking lot and fucked the dancer again, the coke must have worn off and he fell asleep. I hate when that happens. And the two titty bar dancers ran off into the night and the cops busted his ass. And although no one remembers the bartender's name who took a bullet all in the name of overcharging for light beer, everybody remembers the newspaper headline. <laughs> nice. They're fucking nice.